So, if you're a fan of cryptocurrency or Bitcoin specifically, about two days ago, Nassim Nicholas Taleb um, put out a paper, uh, so-called the, the Black Paper, Bitcoin Black Paper, um, where he produced a kind of scathing report of Bitcoin. And so, who is Nassim Taleb? Um, author, author of uh, Full by Randomness, great book, I would recommend everyone should read this book, and um, Anti-Fragile as well. They go into some great info on investing, uh, statistics, um, trading. He was an ex, an ex trader. He's sort of a statistician now. Um, very, very smart guy. He has some videos on uh, the pandemic and virus transmission. I will link his channel in the description because it's definitely um, worth reading. So Nassim Nicholas Taleb doesn't seem to be a fan of Bitcoin. So today what I thought I'd do is just go through his paper, what he's written, and Kind of evaluate some arguments and i think that's really what you guys want to see you want to see a 23 year old guy um who you know has watched all the videos as an expert on uh, cryptocurrencies and bitcoin you know and i can i can call myself that because you know i have you know i follow you know peter schiff uh, but also you know michael saylor and um adam pompiani um you know but also roger ver so you know i got kind of a mix a mix going on of opinions and stuff. So, you know, guys are in safe hands, okay. So, I'm just gonna read the abstract here, this is the paper, I will link as well where you can find this paper. So, introduction slash abstract. This discussion will apply quantitative finance concepts and economic arguments to cryptocurrencies in general and Bitcoin in particular, as there are about 10,000 cryptocurrencies. Yeah, so it's not so, uh, you know, um, limited in supply is Bitcoin if there are 10,000 other cryptocurrencies. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We focus, unless otherwise specified, on the first crypto as per the original protocol and the one with the largest market capitalization. In the current version, in spite of the hype, Bitcoin fails to satisfy the notion of currency without government. It proved not even to be a currency at all. It can be neither a long term or short term store of value. Its expected value is no higher than zero. It's quite a statement cannot operate as a reliable inflation hedge and worst of all does not contribute because not does not constitute not even remotely a tail, tail protection vehicle for catastrophic episodes furthermore there appears to be an underlying conflation between the success of a payment mechanism as decentralized mode of exchange which so far has failed and the speculative variations in the price of a zero-sum asset with massive negative externalities so he's talking about that you are you know, um, you are very vulnerable. He's, he's, he's saying it's a speculative asset and has neither long or short term store of value, which I would, st I would withhold my opinion actually, but you might be able to guess by. So, going through monetary history, we can also see how a true num numeray must be one of minimum variance with respect to an arbitrary basket of goods and services. How gold and silver lost their inflation hedge status during the hunt by the squeeze in the late 70s and what would be required for a few in true inflation hedge store of value. So th the first kind of argument he puts here, there are about 10,000 cryptocurrencies and always what you see parroted around as an argument is that, um, you know, Bitcoin is finite. Bitcoin is, you know, digital gold um, and it's digital gold because, you know, you can't can't copy it there, there are, is a you know inflation protected so that they 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 attribute that there's no inflation in bitcoin to the fact that there's no inflation in gold but you know if there were another metal pretty much identical that you could synthesize that would have all the properties of gold then you know gold value would drop immensely because it would its use would be you know um it would have competition with this other metal and so it, it, it doesn't make sense because, you know, you don't just have one Bitcoin. You have Bitcoin versus 10,000 other cryptocurrencies. And, you know, in any technology, when is one of them the first to succeed? You know, when is one of them the, the most technologically advanced um, and that's going to be the best? So it, it just doesn't, the, the kind of store of, yeah. The, the digital gold argument never really, um, I, I don't think, makes much sense. But anyway, I'll, I'll carry on. So the first page here just kind of goes around and it kind of just explains what um, the 
Oh. Oh my goodness. That's why you don't have a beard, guys. Anyway, page two. So, so I'll go to the comment first. Why Bitcoin is worth exactly zero? Gold and other precious metals are largely maintenance-free and do not degrade over here historical rising. They do not require maintenance to refresh their physical properties over time. Cryptocurrencies require a sustained amount of interest in them. So I think this is true, and it kind of leads into the sort of Ponzi scheme, um, things that are attributable to Bitcoin. The fact that, you know, it is it does, I think, work off a greater full theory. You need someone else to buy the Bitcoin at a higher price to make sure you profit, because what are you going to do with the Bitcoin? What, what else is your profit when using a Bitcoin? Your profit, I guess, is the amount you would save in dollars um, if you did that transaction over borders, you know, with a traditional banking system. So that's the only way you could ever make a profit with Bitcoin unless you sell it to someone else. And so, you know, what, what the what is the value of that worth? What is that worth? But, um, you know, yeah, you, you need extreme amounts of energy um, and time dedicated to keep this network up and running. Whereas gold and silver, you just, you just have them in a vault you know, or on your property and, and they stay that way forever. So I think that's, you know, a pretty pretty good good argument there from the scene. So this first bit of the page is talking about um, the mining fees and how that works and how you need um, ever increasing amounts of miners willing to bid up the um, transaction costs um, in order to secure the network and compete and, you know, to gain the fees and, and mine. Bitcoin. You know the word mine, it, it's it's deliberately used as the word mine, so that in your head you think of precious metal, not just distributed, because that's kind of what it is. I think they're just distributed from, you know, or they're created, but they're not they're not mined. I, I think the word mine is a bit disingenuous. But, um, yeah, so they are using an energy source, and they will ever always need to for eternity to keep the Bitcoin up and running. And as well as that, you have extremely high transaction costs. So what use is a currency that can take, you know, $1, $50, you know, even like $100 to send to send anything on the Bitcoin exchange? How does that make it a currency? So it can't, it can't, be, it's not a currency. It's a failed currency, obviously. I mean, after 2017, I think it had already shown that it had failed to be a currency. And more people were actually unadopting it. You had, you know, I think different websites actually removing Bitcoin because they didn't want to have to, to deal with it. So, I mean, it's not a currency. Some Something else, I think, um, I don't know where this was, but something can only be um, a store of value if it's a medium of exchange first. So take something like gold, which was used as a medium of exchange for, you know, thousands of years. Uh, people were paid in gold, you know, they got their salaries in gold and they would you know, transact in, you know, gold coins or silver coins or something. Um, so so gold was a medium of exchange, uh, sorry, a store of value, because you are storing the, the the value in the future that you would be able to use it as a medium of exchange. You are storing, you know, the, the wealth that you would be able to buy with that gold coin that you put in a vault. You are storing your ability to buy something else in the future with it, right? So that what that's what makes it a store of value. So if Bitcoin is not being used as a medium of exchange, you know, the float, I don't know what the float of Bitcoin is, which is like the amount, the percentage of Bitcoin, which is like actually transacted. If it's extremely low, um, then, and it, it, it's still, you would expect if it was being used as an actual currency, you know, a medium of exchange, then, you know, you would see it. And I don't know what percentage of people are buying it for. It seems like you know, basically no one, everyone is buying it just as a speculative thing, hoping that in the future it will be used as a medium exchange, which just makes no, no sense at all. Um, so yeah, it, it, it is not store of value. You are not storing any value because it has no current use as a medium of exchange. It's just impractical, impossible to use. You know, there are plenty of other cryptocurrencies, you know, that can do that just infinitely better. So why, why you would even say Bitcoin is a store of value, I, I don't know. Um, I might make a bigger video on this, but for now I'll get back to um, the Seams article. So, 
He says earnings free assets are problematic. That's just here. So earnings free assets are problematic. A central result, even principle, in the rational expectations and security prices literature is that thanks to the price thanks to the law of iterated expectations, if we expect that we will expect the price to vary, and by backward induction such a variation much must, must be incorporated into the price now. So if you you know if you expect bad news, then the price now is, is pushed lower because of that. When there are no dividends, as with growth companies, there is still an expectation of future earnings and of future expected rewards to stock stockholders, directly via dividends or indirectly via reverse uh, dilutions and buybacks. Earnings-free assets are problematic, so this this would be gold um, or something like Bitcoin. The implication is that owing to the absence of any dividend yield benefiting the holder of Bitcoin, if we expect that at any point in the future the value will be zero when miners are the, when miners are extinct the technology becomes obsolete future generations get into other such assets and bitcoin loses its appeal to them then the value must be zero now so i think this is probably one of the best arguments so in regards to what i said earlier about bitcoin being you know one of 10,000 cryptocurrencies if any other one of those currencies will replace bitcoin in the future then its current use is zero. It's like, um, say I have um, a store and I say, okay, for the next year, um, we'll accept, you know, bottle caps or something as a currency and you can buy, you know, um, buy bottle caps. Actually, that's a bad example. So I, I couldn't really think of a better example, um, but just, you know, just to read that again, if you expect that at any point in the future the value will be zero when miners are extinct, their technology becomes obsolete, which I personally think is probably the biggest um, reason why Bitcoin won't work. Um, the technology will be surpassed by other cryptocurrencies that don't have extremely high transaction fees or wait times. I mean, the, the, the wait times. In 2017, I think I heard that um, the reason a load of companies stopped accepting Bitcoin was because the chargeback period is like two weeks or something. So. You could send a transaction to the, you know, um, the, the ledger or whatever to get it, you know, pass through. And if someone outbid you within, you know, two weeks or something, it would be, you know, refunded. So it was just a, a terrible, um, terrible, you know, payment mechanism. It just doesn't work. So it's, it's not a currency. And so you you don't have um, any any value there. And if the technology it will become obsolete and the miners... You know will go extinct then the value now is zero um why would you hope that anyone else is buying it? it's just you know it's a greater fool theory that if there aren't any great you know the minute there aren't it just crashes in the moment they can't get more people you know on the, the, the train then it just goes under so yeah i'll read on the comparison of bitcoin to gold is poor we will later see how precious metals lost its quality as medium of exchange, gold and other dividend-free precious metals, precious items such as metals or stones, have held some financial stasis for more than 6,000 years. Yeah, that's, a, that's one of the things that, um, you know, th there's, a, there's a law which is the, the more time something has gone on, the more likely it is to continue going on. Um, and, you know, some laws have and things people can say oh well bitcoin's been around for you know 12 years or something so that means it will continue on for another 12 you know hey it it, it might but um i mean it, it the technology is obsolete i mean gold is not going to be replaced by gold too you know there's just not another element for that you know there's only so many elements in the periodic table and gold is you know one of the ones that doesn't tarnish and has all these uses you know you're storing the value that in the future you know you could turn it into jewelry which someone will want, and there is an existing marketplace for. And people like shiny things. So, you know, yeah, it sounds crude, and, you know, people are, it's, it's like people are too smart to understand gold, in a way. I think they're just like, they, they, they want to be complicated and, you know, be crypto investors, and it's all fine when, you know, the it's riding up, but when it comes crashing down, and people realize, like, okay, well, why am I buying this? This cryptocurrency if I'm not going to actually trade with anyone for it right
right? Or you're you're just speculating. You're you're literally just gambling. So principle one, cumulative ruin. If any non dividend yielding asset has the tiniest probability of hitting the absorbing barrier, then its present value must be zero. So he's he's talking about the same thing, why Bitcoin is worth exactly zero here. Um, or sorry about the you know if the, the future value will be zero then the value in the present must be zero as well so into the next page that's four pages here so I'll read this one bit the difference between the current Bitcoin bubble and past recent ones such as the dot com episode spanning the period over 1995 to 2000 is that shell companies were at least promising some kind of future revenue stream Bitcoin would escape such a valuation approach had it proven to be a medium of exchange or satisfied the condition from a numeracy of one off of which other goods could would be priced, but currently it is not, as we will see next. So he's saying that other goods are not priced um, actually in Bitcoin. So all the Bitcoin bubble, I mean, I think all the people who are buying Bitcoin, the average age of a Bitcoin holder is about 35, and so they weren't really alive in you know the dot com crash um you know or they weren't old enough to have lost any money in dot com where people were buying you know internet stocks that had you know started out of a basement and had no you know actual cash flow but at least then you had you know the promise of future dividends i mean if you buy bitcoin what are you going to get you're you're literally not going to get anything you're just hoping that someone will buy it off you for more but why 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 would anyone do that I would anyone do that? Certainly not me. <laughs> I'm not going to do that. Um, so comment two: success for a currency. There is a conflation between success for a digital currency, which requires some stability and usability, and speculative price appreciation. So transactions of Bitcoin are considerably more expensive than wire transfers or other modes, or ones in other cryptocurrencies. Very true. Um, and also the magnitude slower than standard commercial systems used by credit card companies. Yeah, that's that's very true. So I said you would have to wait 10 minutes if you use Bitcoin, and I think that's right. Um, of course, it depends. The more people that adopt it, the slower it's going to be, I think, and you know, the more the transaction costs will be, and the more energy you have to waste. So how does, how does it make sense for it to be scalable? It's just not scalable. Um, yeah. And to date, 12 years into its life, in spite of the fanfare, with the possible exception of the price tag of Salvadoran citizenship, which is three Bitcoins, there are currently no price fixes, prices fixed in Bitcoin, floating in fiat currencies in the economy. So no one is selling goods priced in Bitcoin, right? No one is selling goods priced in Bitcoin. I think that's an argument why. Because it, it, it's it's clearly not being used as a medium of exchange. No one is actually offering. Maybe in the beginning, you know, when it was coming to be adopted, you actually did have that because the transaction fees were so low. You had people, you know, selling on things online for actual Bitcoin rather than dollars. And when when people say Bitcoin is being adopted as a currency, it's it's actually not. It's actually not the Bitcoin that the people are selling. You know, you can go to um, a gold manufacturer and buy Bitcoin, uh, sell your Bitcoin through a plugin, but all you're doing is giving your Bitcoin to this third party thing. They then sell that on the exchange, give you the cash instantly, so you don't have to worry about the chargeback fees, and then just sending those dollars to the actual vendor. So you're, you're just selling the Bitcoin to a third party, getting dollars and then giving the dollars to the person. So you're not actually trading the Bitcoin. The, the Bitcoin is not being traded, it's just like you know, me selling gold and then getting dollars and then giving the dollars to the other person. So it doesn't, it doesn't make sense. Um, just reading some more here. Yeah, so just talking about how metals aren't really the greatest investment. Um, I, I would tend to agree. I tend to agree. I think it's better to buy um, stocks and a buy and hold um, strategy. I think, you know, generally that works. Um, Random Walk Down Wall Street, that's a good book. I'd recommend. Recommend reading that. I really would. Comment through payment system. There is a conflation of accepting Bitcoin for payments and pricing goods in Bitcoin, so that the price in Bitcoin must be fixed 
with a conversion into fiat floating rather than the reverse. So that, that's what I what I just mentioned, that no one is actually pricing their goods in Bitcoin um, for an actual acceptance into a payment system. You have to have people actually fixing their prices in Bitcoin. Let's go deeper into how our currency can come about. Yeah, let's do that on the final page here. So I'll read you this section here. To be able to regularly buy goods denominated in Bitcoin, that is fixed in Bitcoin, floating in US dollars or some other fiat currency, one must have an income that is fixed in Bitcoin. Such an income must have from somewhere, say, an employer. Must come from employer. For an employer to pay a salary fixed in Bitcoin, she or he must be getting reserves fixed in Bitcoin. Furthermore, for the vendor to offer a can of beer in fixed Bitcoin, she or he must be paying for the raw material and have overhead fixed in Bitcoin. So the whole transaction system, money system needs to change. The same with the mismatch, mismatch of assets and obligations on a balance sheet. All this requires a parity Bitcoin USD of low enough volatility to be tolerable and for variations to remain inconsequential. If someone prices goods in Bitcoin and the value fluctuates from the initial fixing, the price will be directly or indirectly arbitraged. So this is all about the actual volatility of Bitcoin and how you know, if you price things in Bitcoin but the price is so volatile no, no one's going to price things here because you know I mean first of all why would you, why would you do that why would you price, price it in something which has extremely old transaction times and which is less usable to the normal person than a credit card it doesn't it just doesn't make sense and how's that how's that going to get faster if you're going to use you know lightning network or something then maybe but I, I don't I don't believe any I don't believe anyone knows what they're talking about when they're even talking about that stuff quite frankly um, so I think we, we're getting to the end really of the main arguments I will link this if you want to have a larger look through it but um, I think I've kind of main points are almost done Yeah, note that Bitcoin is seen in figure one maintained an extremely high volatility throughout its life, between 60% and 100% annualized, and what is worse, at higher prices, which makes its capitalization considerably more volatile, rising in price as shown in figure two. Is it too volatile to fail? So figure one and figure two. Yeah, Bitcoin returned three months annualized volatility does not seem to drop over time so yeah it, it's it's still volatile so we always hear the argument about it being less volatile as it's adopted I mean when you have no fundamentals it's literally just based off um, you know um, buying you know at a higher price than the other person you're not getting a dividend there's nothing to base the actual valuation on then you this volatility is not going to go away um, and wh why would normal people adopt this why do they want this well, oh, well, if you can convince them to get into it because it's a speculative bubble and they just don't ever sell it. So that's why you always hear this stuff, you know, about just toddle the Bitcoin. These are, you know, the big whales, the biggest investors, you know, pushing this, you know, cult-like behavior, basically, to never sell your Bitcoin because that is what will make the volatility go down over time. So they want you to never sell your Bitcoin while you know, it just goes up in price and then they can probably dump on you at some point. So it's, it's literally a cult. And yeah, figure two, too volatile to fail. Show volatility of the capitalization of Bitcoin. Tyler's was capitalization, return volatility compound. So it actually gets more volatile as the market cap increases, um, which would make sense, I think, if you have, you know, um, a speculative bubble eventually gets so big that it pops and so the volatility is going to increase with the capitalization rather than decrease I think that's a fair point and he's talking about inflation hedge as well yeah we never really had Bitcoin testers as a proper a proper you know sustained recession either it's just been speculative speculative um, why has the price gone up so much there's this kind of inflation fear um, but also, you know, people have spare money. If they didn't, maybe they wouldn't be putting it into Bitcoin. 
it actually happened to save that properly. This does not mean that a cryptocurrency cannot displace fiat. It is indeed desirable to have a real currency without a government. But the new currency just needs to be more appealing as a store of value by tracking a weighted basket of goods and services with minimal error. Displacing fiat is not easy, it has been done locally, though no single item has proved to be permanent and for the difficulty is best represented in the full example. It's a good example, I like this actually. For instance, during the 1970s, the Italian national telephone tokens, the Gatoni, were considered acceptable tender, almost always accepted as payment. The price of the espresso in Lira varied, but it remained sticky to the Gatoni. So this is interesting. So you have something being used as a currency. Why? Because it has um, a real world use, right? You can, you can store these tokens and then use them in the future to pay for your telephone service, right? So a little, a little token and, you know, they're don't think they're divisible, which would be something that you would want the currency to be. But, you know, um, fairly transactable, fairly easy to transact in. And so this makes sense. Um, but it goes on to say, you know, while... Obviously, when you have mobile phones coming along, um, suddenly your currency, which is pegged, you know, to the use of the telephone system, is now obsolete. And so I think this is where the kind of technological changes... Um, come in makes it makes it extremely vulnerable to something like that but the problem is that owing to technological changes in the long term no single item such as telephone call will permanently track inflation indices and act as a store of value consider that communications got cheaper over time and the notion of a telephone call is today in the zoom days obsolete even categories have their weights naturally revised over time and the share of food and housing declined tenfold as a share of the western consumer uh, since the Great Recession. Thus, we can look at the inflation hedge as the analog of the minimum variance in memory. Okay, so that, that's basically the uh, end of the paper there. So, what do I think about this? Um, I think Nassim Taleb is a smart guy. The people just calling us you know, FUD and stuff um, are probably deluding themselves and in a cult and definitely getting their information from the wrong places. Uh, probably from Twitter and um, from shills who um, don't really understand any any economics at all and have an incentive to make you buy into something um, because the, you know that's a great full theory and they will get richer. So you know when anyone buys into Bitcoin, they are incentivized to they are incentivized to promote the narrative that it will in the future be the world's you know reserve currency, which is just so utterly ridiculous but um yeah the, so it's not even being used as a currency now because it's it's totally rubbish the transaction fees are stupid and so how is it going to be used as a currency in the future what value are you storing in the future when there's even more technologies competing against bitcoin than today so um i hope you learned something from my um expert analysis of course bitcoin expert i will put in that in my linkedin um, and Facebook probably and uh, YouTube I might uh, turn this channel entirely into Bitcoin coverage because I love Bitcoin um, and you can tell that um, I really love it and I think it's it's going to be the future guys you know, you've got nothing to worry about um, your you know grandmother's savings and your house that you mortgaged um, like your guru told you to do it's going to be totally safe in Bitcoin don't worry yourself okay